Well, good morning, church. Excited to talk to you this morning about a one another passage again. Can you believe it? Uh, Today we want to talk about a one another Christian, and we want to remind ourselves, as we've been every time, that all of this is based out of Jesus' words on the night he would be betrayed in John chapter 13. And so I was hoping you'd recite this with me. We'll just read it together. Ready? A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love for one another. Now turn to the person next to you and say, we just talked King James together. But what I wanted you to notice as we work through that is that this is the key one another passage. This is the one that says, if you do this, everyone will know that you're my disciple. This is my new command for you, that you love one another. And part of loving one another is thinking about what we have to offer that brings out the best, that blesses someone else. And so we learned about this word all alone, which means one another. We learned that the word is used over 100 times in the New Testament, that uh, 47 times it's telling disciples like us how we should react or treat one another. And Paul was really big on this word. And so I want us to constantly be reminding ourselves that loving one another is taking this concept of love and then appropriating it to people the best way that we can. For instance, uh, you know, the golden rule is to do unto others what you would have others do unto you. What that really means is do for others what's in their best interest, right? In other words, if I think about Suzanne, I might uh, do for her what she would have me do. I, I would bring her flowers because that blesses her. But if she brings me flowers... Uh, I'd rather have chocolate chip cookies, you know. Uh, But we think about what do we have to offer that really blesses or shows love to the other person. And so we, we discover that all of these one another passages flow out of loving one another. And today you probably notice we're going to talk about how do we encourage one another. And we'll notice that encouragement is the second side of a coin... Uh, that goes with comfort. But today I wanted to talk to us about encouraging one another. And our key passages come from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and from Hebrews chapter 10. Notice this verse. It says, encourage one another and build each other up. Okay, that's a great verse, but notice it in its context. It says that we're supposed to do this and that we should be doing it all the time, as in fact that you are doing If you put it in its context in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, what you notice about this passage is that it's reminding us that the Lord is coming back. It's reminding us that this world is not our home. It's reminding us that we have no idea when the Lord is going to return. It's going to be sudden. It's going to be unexpected. And when he comes, we should be paying attention. We should be on watch. We should be prepared. And we should understand that there's going to be a judgment day that follows that. And what Paul says is, you should be reminding each other, this world is not our home. We're not guaranteed 80 years or more. We don't know that the Lord's not coming back today. And so we should live our lives in such a way is that we're prepared for the Lord's arrival this day. And that we should encourage each other and remind each other of that fact. That we have an unshakable hope and we should be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Then you find this verse in Hebrews chapter 10 that uses this same phrase. It's using encouragement to talk about how do we stir up love and good works in one another. Notice it from Hebrews 10, 24. It says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing... But let us encourage one another, and all the more as we see that great day approaching. We should be together. We should be encouraging each other. We should be asking the question, how do I bring out the best in other people? How do I be for them what they need to be the very best they can be? 
And how can other people spur me on? Have you ever run a race and as you're running it, you see somebody on the side who's just there to cheer for you? I'm not fast, but I do run long distance races every so often. And to get towards the end and to see somebody that's just there, they've already finished and they've come back to kind of help me get there. I mean, it's very encouraging, you know, to have somebody that's spurring you on. And that's what the church is supposed to do when we gather together, is to encourage each other and to tell each other, press on, keep in this. This is the fight of your life. And so let's do this together because life is hard and we need people that are encouraging us to finish strong. So we meet together, we encourage one another, we understand the value of being together to motivate each other to love and to good works. And so with that in mind, I wanted to talk to us super quickly about this roadmap for today. How do we encourage one another? And I've got three little thoughts for you. One is encouragement. What is it? The second one is, is there a model we can follow? And the third is how to do it. And so I wanted to start by just asking the question, encouragement, what is it? It's the other side of the coin of comfort. It's the same word, parakaleo, to come alongside. Just picture somebody who's like a, a boxer who's running early in the morning. You remember in the Rocky movies that uh, uh, Rocky's running along and there's somebody on a bicycle riding along with him to encourage him and push him forward and help him to keep doing what he's doing. We all need somebody who comes alongside us, sometimes to comfort us and sometimes to spur us on, to stir us up, to make us the best that we can be. And so this word is parakalesis, and it means both of those things, to come alongside, to comfort, to encourage, to exhort, to stir up, to help to be the best that they can be. And so it combines exhorting, comforting, and encouraging together. And it calls upon us to exhort, to desire the best for others, to pray for them, to entreat God on their behalf because we want to be an encouragement to other people, giving courage, giving hope, giving confidence. And so one of the things that we discover is encouragement is finding the courage to give courage. It's stepping up to give courage to other people. And what we'll notice is that you can't do that and be dormant. You have to be actively involved in the lives of other people. Because what we know right now is we live in a world where a lot of people are saying, I can't. And they need somebody who sees the best in them, who knows, no, you can. And so what is it? I hope I've described that. It's this word that means to come alongside, to encourage, to comfort, to to strengthen, to stir up, to bless. So who is a model that we could follow? How about this guy named Joseph? Do you remember him? Y'all are thinking, Joseph? I'm not sure I've... Have you ever heard that name before? Joseph. Oh, okay, Acts 4. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul... Neither did anyone say that any of their possessions were their own, but they had all things in common. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought them with their proceedings that were sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and they distributed it to anyone who had need. And this guy, Yosis, who also was given the name Barnabas, isn't it interesting we don't even know his real name? We just know him as Barnabas. Well, that was his nickname. Yosef, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which means son of encouragement, was a Levite from Cyprus who, having land, sold it and brought the land and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Here was somebody who was so known by his life of stirring up, spurring on, encouraging, blessing that they just had to give him the name, Son of Encouragement. And I've always thought that's a great name, but I really got to thinking about it uh, this week and thinking about what would it mean for somebody to say, you are a daughter of encouragement, you are a child of encouragement. Uh, the word in the Aramaic bar, 
means son, and Nabia means prophecy or exhortation or encouragement. So he was the one that whenever he showed up, it seemed like he had a, an important word to say. But it means parakalesis in the Greek. And I want you guys to think about the fact that that's the same word that is used to talk about the Holy Spirit in John chapters 15, 16, uh, 14, 15, and 16. Parakaleo, to come alongside the comforter, the counselor, the exhorter, the encourager, talking about the Holy Spirit. And so Barnabas was somebody who was so full of the Holy Spirit that when he showed up at a situation, it was like he was the Holy Spirit giving encouragement to other people. And they always felt so blessed when he came on the scene because there was something about him that lifted the spirits and brought out the best in everyone else. So they just had to call him Son of Encouragement. And that became his nickname everywhere he went. Son of the Holy Spirit's working. Daughter of the Holy Spirit's working. He was just the Holy Spirit coming into a room and blessing people. And that's why it says about him in Acts chapter 11, Barnabas was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit and faith and great numbers of people were brought to the Lord. And what we know about Barnabas, not only did he give sacrificially, not only did he travel and preach and exhort, but we also know that when there was conflict, he was the one that went and brought people back who were on the outskirts. He was the one that brought... Paul back into the fold of the church when people didn't know what to do with him. He was the one that helped with Paul and Barnabas and Silas and, and John Mark. He was just the blessing. Everywhere he went, he was the encourager to others. And so we've got a model for what this looks like, to be the son of encouragement, the person who shows up to bless other people. And so we know what it is. We have an idea of somebody who's done it. And so let's ask the question, how would we do it? I think I'm going to be pretty simple today. Here's what the passage says. It says, let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good works. Let us consider. What does that mean? It means we actually have to quit thinking about ourselves and start thinking about other people. It means we have to start thinking, what do I have to offer that can be a blessing? What is it that I have that can bring encouragement, spur somebody on, stir them up, give them what they need in this dark moment in their day? How is it that I can be for them what they need right now? Look what this passage says in Proverbs. It says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. The right word at the right time can be such a blessing in somebody's life. The right word spoken the right way at the right time. If we consider how and when to speak in order to bless other people, God will use us to speak life into other people and to be the blessing that they need. But we have to consider what we have to offer that can spur or stir one another up to love and to good needs. And what we know is that there are people all around us who are just longing for somebody to be a help to them. They're drowning under a sea of obligations that seem to be too much. Uh, they're having a, a bad day and need to hear from someone who knows that they're not alone. Business is not going well and they just need somebody to throw them a lifeline and be helpful. Let us consider how we can spur one another on, stir one another up to love and to good deeds. And that's where Paul says we should have words that we can offer to encourage one another. And we have to understand that sometimes God wants us to speak because words can make a difference. Words can be a blessing, a quick little note to somebody else, a text before they go in for a job interview, something in a lunchbox that just says, I'm thinking about you today. Uh, 
you all know what it's like to have something that comes your way that just reminds you how important somebody else thinks you are. And what I bet, if you're like me, I've got so many notes from Suzanne. Ever since we started dating, I've kept everything she's ever sent me. Um, and I just keep it all because it means something when she has something positive to say to me. Uh, my kids, you know, I, I keep them all. But I've got notes from some of you. I have get emails that I get regularly from one of us who always sends me a beautiful picture of a bird and a little note that tells me, uh, not a cat, Julio, sorry, but a bird. And it just tells me uh, an encouraging word. You know, I've got somebody else that texts me every Sunday afternoon with just an encouraging word. But we all know people who, who do something that just is outside of themselves to be a blessing. And what we know is we could be that person. We could be that person in our office. We could be that place in our school. We could be the person in the community that everybody says, oh, the community is better because they are there. And that's what we want to be. And so I've talked to you about what it is. I've talked to you about a model for how to do it. I've talked to you about how we could do it. And so now let me give you three tips. The first one is spur one another on. Sometimes people need encouragement to get moving again. Any of us want to admit that? Sometimes I need a swift kick in the pants. I do. Sometimes I need a swift kick in the pants. I'd like it to be a polite swift kick in the pants, if you don't mind. But somebody just needs to say, uh, Sager, you know, it's time to get moving again. It's time to, time to step up. It's time for you to take it back to where it needs to be. You need somebody that can spur you on. Now, what I want you to think about this is who loves the horse more than the cowboy? Nobody. For that cowboy, the horse is his ally, his closest friend. But yet the spur is there to spur it on, to be the best it can be, to say, come on, it's time for us to get moving. This is where we need to go. And so we read this verse and it says that we have to un hold unswervingly to hope because God is faithful and we should consider how we can help each other out of love to move in the direction that we need to go, to be what we need to be. And we've got to be together so that we can encourage each other in this way. Complacency is the deadly enemy of spiritual progress. The contented soul is the stagnant soul. We all need people who are spurring us on to keep on. Because we need it. I love this quote from Max Licato. I think it's one of his best. He says, God loves you just the way you are. But he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. And that's why you spur people on. Because you love them so much, you want them to be the very best that they can be. And so you're friends, you're encouraging each other, you're spurring one another on because you want each other to be the very best that we can be. The reason that preachers sometimes step on toes, the reason that sometimes hard things are said is because part of preaching the word, it says, is to be prepared to correct, to rebuke, and to encourage with great patience and with careful instruction. All of these things are the way that we speak truth to one another. So we spur one another on. Number two, second tip, stir one another up. So sometimes we're spurring others on, but sometimes we're just asking, how can we help them to be the very best version of themselves? How can we give them that inner confidence? Do you know somebody that when they have inner confidence, you can see it on their face and they thrive in all that they do? And when they don't, it seems to affect everything about them. I know people like that. I have students in my class that I can tell when they feel confident and I can tell when they don't. And when, when they feel confident, they can do anything. And when they don't, it seems like it affects everything about them. 
And so we want to help people be stirred up to be the best that they can be. To understand we believe in them. That we see God, Holy Spirit working within them. That we know that God has a plan for them. And God's going to do great things through them. They've just got to persevere and keep on. And so I consider this a lot like Country Time Lemonade. You know, we all know how to make Country Time Lemonade. I mean, it's not that hard. You read the instructions, you pour the water in the pitcher, you dump in the mix, but you better stir it up, right? Because what we know is the one on the left will quench your thirst, but it won't taste that good. The one in the middle is stirred up, but if you really think about how to bring out the best in other people, it's like taking them to the next level. Your stirring allows them to be the very best that you can be. And so one of the greetings that people say in Israel is rise up and be the best you can be because the world is waiting for you. The world needs you to be the best version of yourself you can possibly be. Because God's created a world that needs you to step in and be salt and light in the middle of it. And so we consider, how can we stir one another up? And that's frankly where I wanted to t say there are three kinds of people in the world. Those who can count and those who can't. I put that one in for a few math people in here that I thought would appreciate that. Did any of my math teachers appreciate that one? So, was, okay, there are three kinds of people in the world. And what I want us to understand is that there are three kinds of people in the world. There are energy givers, there are energy takers, and there are energy wasters. And I, I try to say this to students all the time, especially student teachers. This is the first thing I tell a student teacher when I meet with them before they go in for their first day of teaching. And I say, remember, you're walking into a classroom and there is a teacher that's just praying that you're going to be an energy giver and not an energy taker. Energy takers are like, with all due respect, I love Winnie the Pooh, but Eeyore is an energy taker, right? Wah, wah, you know, everywhere Eeyore goes, he goes kind of, you know, wah, wah, and there's a dark cloud that follows, and the glass is always, you know, half empty and on the way to being fully empty, and there are just people that when they walk into a room, you go, oh boy, okay, right? Let me gear up my positivity because they're going to try and drain it as quickly as they can. And we know people who come into situations and they just bring everybody else down because they're depressed, they're demoralizing, and they're just hard. You, you don't want to be that person, okay? Okay. But what I've also noticed is that the tendency in our world today isn't to be an energy taker, it's just to be an energy waster. Most of us walk into situations and we don't ask the question, how can we make the situation better? We just kind of sit there. Like my dad would say, a bump on a log. And we don't make things better, we don't make things worse, we just kind of coexist with things. And because we're there, nothing gets better, nothing gets worse, we just don't add any value to the situation. It's what I say about celery, it adds no value to anything, you know. It's just there, you know, what's the purpose of celery? Suzanne loves celery, I just don't get it, okay. But but for everyone, we got to understand that we need to be people who actually add value to the relationships that we come in contact with. And what I've noticed about college students, and I'll talk to them about this in my class, I wait until the second week of class, and then I ask students how many of them know the person's name sitting to their left and to their right, behind them and in front of them. Can you tell me those four people's names? Because you've sat in class with them for four sessions. We're in our fifth time of meeting. Do you know the people next to you? And what do you know about that? What's happened is every day they walk into class, they sit down in their desk, and they pull out their phone, and they text people who are not present until I start teaching, 
and then we have class. And then when class is over, they get up and leave, and they never interacted with anybody that was present in the room because they were absorbed with what was happening on their device. And what I think is happening in our world today is that we are missing the opportunity to be a blessing to the people we are present with because we are distracted by the social media all around us. And we've got to be people who decide that we're going to be present for the people that we are present with. And part of that is understanding that we come with the opportunity to be an energy giver, to make things better, to be the one that stirs up other people, who offers this kind word. I tell people that if you want to know the secret to being a blessing to other people's life, there's three letters, SWT. This is not in your notes. I think that I could go on the road and sell this consulting for $500, okay? I'm going to give it to you guys for free right now if you'd like it, okay? SWT. You got to say that out loud first off though, right? SWT. Okay, so now the S stands for a smile. Turn to the person next to you and smile. What do you notice when you turn to the person next to you and smile? Yeah. There is, there, God created us with endorphins that once we see a smile, we smile. How does it go? Smile and the whole world smiles with you. Yeah. So you can come into every situation with a smile. The W stands for a word. You can come into every situation with an encouraging word or a blessing. You can show up with something positive to say about other people. You can acknowledge other people's presence. You can encourage them with a word. And the T stands for touch. And it's appropriate touch. It could be a fist pump. It could be a handshake. It could be a slap on the back. But people crave touch, appropriate touch. But what you notice is that a lot of people will go through their day and not get touched, especially older adults, and that we crave somebody who will actually appropriately bless us with a touch. A smile, a word, a touch. But every one of us has the opportunity to be a blessing, to be an encouragement to other people. And so I want us to understand that encouragers are people who come with energy to give to every situation. And they understand that that's the Holy Spirit working through them to be a blessing to the lives of other people. But you got to be somebody who let us consider how to do this. we got to be thinking about it. We've got to decide that we're a thermostat and not a thermometer. That we walk into a situation not to reflect the temperature in the room, but to change it. But to be the person that makes things right, makes things the way that they ought to be, motivates other people. And so we come with good words, we come with good actions, but we want to see the best in other people to spur them on to love and to good deeds. So if you're thinking with me so far, the first one was spur, the second one was stir, and the third one is assure. That's the best rhyme I could get for you today, okay? Spur, stir, and assure one another with words of hope. Words of strength, words of encouragement. You know, Rabbi... uh, Google can help you (laughs) with uh, words of encouragement. Uh, It's important to be able to turn to God's word and give it as something that encourages other people. What does Hebrews say? It says, the word of God is alive and active. It's the only words that you can offer to somebody else that come with a power to transform. These are the words of a living God, and these words are active and alive, sharper than a two-edged sword. And so they can penetrate to the soul, the joint, the marrow, judges, hearts, and attitudes. And so sharing scripture with people to encourage them, assuring them with the word of God can be a real blessing in the lives of others. And Rabbi Google will tell you if you just ask him about Bible verses that can encourage people on a difficult day. Or five encouraging scriptures for a wife uh, on her daily walk. Or notice it only needed five for women. It takes 16 for men. Uh, 
but encouraging quotes and, you know, 10 for teens that you can, like, stick in their lunch or text them during the day. But Rabbi Google will help you uh, to find these in the Bible if you will just ask. And so be people who are armed with Scripture that we can share with other people because Paul says we should encourage each other with these words, these words that are alive and active. If you wanted to know my two favorites, here they are. It's when somebody says, remember, Scott, God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? There are times when that has given me great comfort and great confidence to remember that God is for you. And if God is for you, who could possibly be against you? Or in the same chapter, nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And understanding that there are times when that's exactly what I need to hear, is that there is nothing on all the earth that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we find things that we can say to other people that assure them Because we want to spur people on, we want to stir people up, and we want to assure them of the hope that we have together. So can you say that with me? Spur, stir, assure. That's our thoughts for how can we be an encourager to others. And I want you to think about the fact that you need to be an encourager and you also need to surround yourself with friends that will encourage you. That's why the church is so important. Do not devalue the church. It's the body of Christ. It is the place where you come and people encourage you. They remind you of what's really important and they tell you things that you won't hear anywhere else about your eternal value in Christ Jesus. And so pursue pursue meaningful friendships with other believers that surround you and encourage you, that give you words of encouragement and that you offer to them. A best friend helps you find the rainbow on a rainy day. And scripture says, perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, so does earnest counsel from a friend. We need people that can encourage us, spur us on, and stir us up to love and to good works. And we need to be those kind of people as well. So the message of the day, one another Christianity, let's figure out how we can encourage one another Stir one another up, spur one another on, assure one another with the words of Scripture and remind each other that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ that's found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you need to know Christ in some meaningful way, if we can pray for you today, if you just need to be surrounded by an encouraging church, whatever we can do to bless you, we encourage you to come to the front as we stand and sing this song together.